Coming up, the movie Night Raiders is art imitating life for indigenous peoples. We'll meet Danis Goulet, who wrote and directed the film. Plus, in less than two weeks, runners like Caroline Sikyakwapdua will be at the starting line of the Boston Marathon. We'll catch up with her. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Aliyah Chavez is off today. Quincy Bearrobe could face murder charges from a shooting that took place at a hotel in South Dakota. This past Sunday, the victim, Myron Puyer Jr., died. He had been hospitalized since the shooting. Both men are 19 years old. The shooting took place at the Grand Gateway Hotel in Rapid City. Bearrobe, the alleged shooter, is facing charges of aggravated assault and committing a felony while armed. And now he could face additional charges. Following the shooting, one of the hotel's owners posted on social media that Native Americans would be banned from the hotel property. The post drew strong reactions from tribal leaders and politicians around the country. Indian Collective filed a federal class action civil rights lawsuit against the hotel, its owners, and its parent company. Dr. Lance Fry is now the first tribal surgeon general with his appointment by the Muscogee Creek Nation. The physician is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation, and prior to this appointment, he served as the Oklahoma Commissioner of Health. Tribal leaders say he will focus on health issues facing tribal citizens, such as the high infant mortality rate and the high rates of cancer. He says the tribe has already gathered some data on health issues, and he will start looking at that information to determine health priorities. He told KTUL-TV the overall goal is to help improve the health for Muscogee Creek people. The tribe is set to open a fourth hospital soon. Well, women make up half of the college-educated workforce, but only 28% of them go into science and engineering. That's according to the National Science Board, and one Arizona nonprofit hopes to change that. Caitlin Anawa Boisel has more on the Taking Up Space Camp. I thought it would just look like we, you'd be under the clouds, but you were basically in the clouds. 11-year-old Suvi is from the Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Tribe in Wisconsin. This is her first plane ride ever, and she is going to space camp. It's been fun because you know that it's not just like you who's Native. A group of seven young Native girls between the ages of 9 and 12 have been learning the ropes of space at the Space Education Camp in Huntsville, Alabama. The girls learn everything from science, space, problem solving, and even being positive about their own bodies. And so we just wanted to have a program that we can uplift uh, Native American girls and give them an opportunity, have a little bit of social uh, educational equity, so that way they can uh, pursue STEM or pursue anything they want. Uh, this actually just gives them a sense of confidence. So if they can do STEM and science, it's really tough stuff. I think that can translate to anything that they want to do. They'll know that they have the confidence to accomplish it. Before the girls go to camp, they have a 32 week long course on basic space knowledge and also meet with native STEM leaders such as John Harrington, one of the first natives in space. Well, we decided that, you know, just one year of space camp is good and that's a solid foundation. But if a girl comes here for three years plus our 32 weeks <laughs> of mentoring, that's going to make a huge impact. And hopefully that will get the love of science. The whole goal of the camp is to keep campers coming back, even after their first year. And funding is all donation-based. Community feel for the program, that it's based on people just donating and wanting to help the girls. And that kind of support could always help the young girls develop positive, long-lasting friendships. 
Who's your best friend at camp? I can't pick one. Caitlin Onawa Boisel, Indian Country Today. A young Cherokee citizen is earning money for college by selling a dinosaur card game he created. Dilly Nottingham's game is called Primal Jaws. It's a strategic dinosaur battling game, and he created all of the artwork, branding, and gameplay. It's currently sold in stores from Massachusetts to California. Nottingham has sold more than 700 games through his website and retail outlets. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, we'll talk to Dana Goulet, an award-winning writer and director, and hear about her debut feature, Night Raiders. Dennis Goulet got her start in the creative world of film production by casting extras for movies. She worked behind the scenes and quickly saw the need for indigenous people to make their own films, to be just not the actors, but the writers, directors, and producers. She went on to make several shorts, and her films have been screened at the Berlin International Film Festival, the Toronto International Film Festival, and many more. And last fall, her first feature film was released. It's called Night Raiders, and it's about a Cree mother trying to protect her daughter. Here's a clip. <gasps> Moral, come. Who lives here? The city went dark after the war. No one can see your face. No one. Is that a child? No, no, it's okay. See? I was beginning to believe that my boy was the only free one left. Please! You have a child at the academy? She was taken in the fall. <laughs> The Academy want to start the war again, and they'll force our kids onto the front lines of it. I'm going to find her again, on the other side. As long as we have one piece of land, they will always come for us. Is it too late? No, but we have to go now. We pledge our hearts and give our allegiance to our glorious republic. And solemnly swear to protect it. One country. One language. One flag. That's quite a tease to watch the whole movie. Dana Goulet, welcome and thanks for being with us today. And tell us how you came up with the idea to set this story in the future when it's basically a story that's already happened to Indigenous people, both in Canada and the U.S. Yeah, you know, when I set about to start making um, Night Raiders, I wanted to talk about these colonial policies that have impacted so many of our lives and still do to this day, and especially the residential school policy, which was, you know, the child removal policy that was in place for seven generations of Indigenous families. Um, but there was something about the future that um, freed me up as a storyteller to look at this in a new way. 
and also to um, have a fresh way into the topic. I think people sort of get fatigue around these things or they don't want to hear about it or they sort of think it wasn't that bad. But when you put everything all that really happened to us as Indigenous people in one place and one time, um, it really shows just how oppressive these policies were. And so, you know, the dystopian genre sort of offered that and then the future also offered that. It's it's almost um, chilling to say, hey, look, look, live our life, right, as Indigenous people. And now everybody gets to uh, be victim to that, uh, those kinds of policies. And we're talking about removing children and putting them in boarding school and then changing their culture, which is what your movie's about. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, at the time that I started writing this, which was back in 2013, I really felt that this needed to be a national conversation. You know, it was still having such a great impact on so many of our families. And I think that this history was really not talked about and covered up and that it needed to be a conversation. But I also am a storyteller and I just wanted to make an exciting movie that would invite people into this, into this thing that I really wanted to talk about. And tell us how you incorporated, the story is about a Cree mother and you also incorporated Cree culture and language. Yeah, um, my dad is a Cree speaker. Um, he grew up hunting and trapping on the land up in Saskatchewan, where I'm from. And uh, I rely on him for that, for the, de the development of all of my projects. But my favorite parts of the film are when we go to the Cree camp at some point in the movie and everybody's speaking in the language. And, you know, it's really about cultural revitalization. So the young kids are being stolen back from the academies and they're being taught about who they are in the language. And, you know, for me, I was so inspired by so many people in real life that take up this work, whether they're activists or community members or language um, keepers, you know, um, I was really interested in the amazing, incredible work that inspires me that so many people are doing all across Indian country. And since the movie has been released, what kind of reaction have you had first from Indigenous people and then from non-Indigenous people? Yeah, I think it's been really incredible, um, the response. Um, we're nominated for 11 Canadian Screen Awards up here in Canada. So it's like gotten this huge response and we launched as a gala at the Toronto International Film Festival. So um you know, the audiences, when I have had the chance to see it live, it was the first time we saw it at TIFF with a group of people. It was an incredibly moving time. And I think for non-Indigenous people, it gives them insights into the impact. And it's like they grapple with that. Um, and then for Indigenous people, you know, I went back home and I showed it in my home community. And, um, you know, talking to people afterwards, they just told me how proud they were. And that was really amazing because ultimately you know I've made it for us first it's like there's so many times that we as audiences don't get to have priority but it's like I really wanted people to feel like it was theirs you know well it's been a long time coming and um, again in a the world of showbiz is there's really no overnight success, right? <laughs> you work a long time to get to this this place. And um, we're catching up with you today in, in uh, Oklahoma. Tell us what you're doing there. Oh, I am so happy to be down here in Tulsa. I'm working on Reservation Dogs. Season two is underway. And I had known in Sterling Harjo, the showrunner, for many years. Um, I watched all of his shorts, met him back in the day. So I've come down here to direct an episode and I could not be more honored to be a part of this show that has touched so many people. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm so excited to be down here. Well, it's, um, it certainly is a, a hit series. And uh, as you mentioned, it's been renewed. Uh, talk a little bit about just, you know, how many Native shows that or, or shows with Indigenous themes or people that we're seeing today. Um, and again, it's been a long time coming. Is, are, are we at that place now of, of this being common? Um, I think we're just in the midst of a really important explosion and we want to make sure that this keeps happening. But I think it has been a long time coming and it's a result of many over many decades, who, those of us who have been along around time and even before us, 
advocating for the space for us as Indigenous people to tell our own stories and to have agency over our storytelling. But finally, we're getting to this point where we're seeing bigger budgets. Like my film in Canada was um, the largest budget ever given to an Indigenous director to make a feature film. And then we're seeing, you know, reservation dogs being made by major studios and Rutherford Falls. I mean, we're in the midst of a breakthrough and um, it's a very exciting time, but it's also been a really long time coming. <laughs> yes. So after reservation dogs, what are some of the other projects on your plate? Um, after that, I go back to um, finishing off a Netflix thriller that I shot last year up in Canada called Ivy. And then I'm going to go home to start developing some of my own projects that are back about home in northern Saskatchewan. Very good. Well, Dan Goulet, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Patty. Well, we leave the world of film and movies and head to the races. Up next, we'll chat with Caroline Sikekwaptiwa as she prepares to run her ninth Boston Marathon. In the world of running, there are key races that people spend years qualifying for, working on their pacing, their nutrition, and their attitudes, all to make it to that big race. And the one big race coming up in less than two weeks is the Boston Marathon. Each year, many Native runners qualify, and this year it will be Caroline Sikakoptiwa's ninth time running Boston. She's Hopi, and in her culture, running is a spiritual endeavor. She joins us now to talk about that and how she ended up being featured in a shoe company video. Welcome, Caroline. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, perhaps um, the first question people might have is why do you run this long distance? And why do you keep going back to Boston your ninth time this year? Yeah, um, the reason, well, coming from a um, culture of running, I, I just kind of jumped in because everyone did it as a kid. And as I, an adult, I just continue to do it just to honor that, that strong tradition we have with running, um, to honor the, the prayers that come with it and just to keep it going. And um, of course, the health benefits. I'm a grandma and a mom of four, four kids, and I want to be as healthy as I can to, to see them live their lives as well. Um, but yeah, just it's really, it really connects. Um, with our culture and our tradition. And that's that's a big reason why I keep doing it. Um, Boston was always a goal that I had. And I, I thought it was an unattainable goal when I first tried to qualify. And so just um, reaching that goal and I just keep wanting to come back because it was something that I never thought I could do. So that's why I keep coming back to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly is a race that so many runners try to qualify for. And um, for people who don't know the process, you have to qualify at another marathon in the year before. And then getting into Boston, it's even though you qualify, it's not guaranteed that you're going to be one of the runners at the starting line, right? Yes. Um, we've had a, a year where my brother didn't make it and he was short, probably like less than a minute, a very tiny amount of time. So it's never guaranteed even if you do um, get the qualifying time. So it, it's a big it's a big accomplishment and something that I really am am proud of myself for for doing. 
<laughs> and you didn't really, um, you talked about running when you were younger, but you didn't really run long distance, a you know, half marathon, um, until you were an adult. And I believe you were pregnant when you ran your first half marathon. Yes. <laughs> and that was, um, again, a family, a family, we, we kind of run together as a family. And so that, that first marathon was because of my sister-in-law and my brother and they, they had picked it up and, um, I just kind of joined along and then just, we just kept going with it. And pretty soon we were running marathons. So it, it definitely didn't happen until later on in life. And so um, very rewarding though, just, I think I'm able to appreciate it more being older and just all the, my body did this and I'm able to finish this distance. And as a kid or a younger person, I probably wouldn't have been able to appreciate it as much. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, uh, when I introduced you, I said, you know, her culture, but actually it's our culture because I'm from First Mesa, you're from Second Mesa. And in our culture, uh, people really encourage runners when they go out because the prayers that the runners say are for everyone, not just, you know, that person or their family, but it's for everyone. And um, and then the word that we have, Nahongvita, talk a little bit about what that word means to you. Um. Uh, now, Hong Vita, I was always taught it was a word of encouragement when you're doing something really hard and you have to really dig deep and find that inner strength within you um, to finish it. And it, it can be applied to running or even like a spiritual um, dance or something that we're going through. Um, it, it's always a, a um, encouragement. So to me, that's really when I when someone yells that out and I hear it, it really takes me to um, just our, our culture and all the hundreds of years of running that we have within our culture. And I, I carry that, we all carry that strength within us as Hopi runners. And so it's a, a connection to that and a reminder, this is, this is who, who you have, what you have inside you. And, and it's, it's always within you. So that, that's kind of what, and when I hear it in big cities, like, Boston or Chicago, it's really very, very meaningful. So it's very good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, so if people are watching this and they're going to Boston, that's one word that that you encourage them to say to encourage you. Yes. All right. And you know, Hopi, you know, we have a, a long history of, of, of long distance runners. And of course, Louis Diwanima ran in the Olympics and won the silver medal in the 10,000 meter race. And that was in 1912. Um, since then, I think probably uh, there have been a couple of Hopis who've, who've uh, worked to achieve uh, getting to the Olympics. And um, this year we have Kyle Sumatskuku, who is returning for his second Boston Marathon. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the other Native runners that you've met at Boston through the years. Um, I've been very fortunate to um, have a connection with the Wings of America group. And they always take um, a group of young Native runners, but they provide an experience where other runners that are able to come speak with them and participate in events with them. So I've met, uh, oh my gosh, so many other people running the marathon, but also I've met um, Pat, Patty Dillon. Um, she was a, she is a native runner and she did very well in the Boston Marathon, I think second and third place. Um, and this was way before shoe company sponsors, sponsorships and all of that. So just a variety of runners. We always somehow connect. And um, I've also made some good friendships through, through Boston and the Wings of America Foundation. Um, and, and just, um, it's always an a exciting part of running the Boston Marathon is like knowing that I'm going to meet up with runners that I've never met before. And um, just seeing the group of native runners in Boston grow, that's very exciting. <laughs> it, it's, it's growing every year and it, it's exciting. And certainly thousands of runners come to Boston and participate. And this year, out of all of those runners, you were selected to be featured in a video by Brooks Running Shoe. And um, you were surprised by the runner, Des Linden, who actually won the Boston Marathon. Tell us about that experience. How did you get picked? And what was it like meeting Des? Um, so it all came about um, because of our last year, my brother and I fundraised for the Hopi Foundation for um, education scholarships. And uh, we were lucky to be featured in a runner's world article. And so Brooks 
saw that article and they reached out to me and asked me if I would like to apply for this. And I had no idea Des was going to be part of it. I thought it was just sharing our story. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to get the, get it out there that um, we're Hopi, we're fundraising. And <laughs> so unfortunately, my brother didn't um, get to do Boston this year, but I'm fundraising for another organization in Hopi. So I was I jumped on it and just to get it out there. And um, yeah, it was uh, a day, a full day of shooting and I was just kind of talking about what Hopi running means to me. And um, Des walks up in the middle of me talking and it was, it was so exciting. I got to run um, a short run with her and just chat with her very down to earth and very, um, it, it was just really cool, a very cool experience to be able to, to um, meet an elite runner on that level. So <laughs> very cool. <laughs> well, I think a lot of our viewers would say you're an elite runner too, but being uh, the ninth time returning to Boston. Caroline Sikakoptiwa, thank you so much for joining us today and best to you at Boston Marathon. Thank you for having me. And that will do it for us today. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thalohungba. Join us again tomorrow. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can Oh, you got to run, you got to run, got to run.